You're now listening to The Brian Callen Show with your host, Brian Callen. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest is Dr. James J. Uh, James G. Rickards. Uh, he's been on a podcast before. He's an American lawyer, economist, investment banker, uh, a regular commentator on finance, the author of the New York Times bestseller, Currency Wars, The Making of the Next Global Crisis. And we are here to talk about the death of money, the coming collapse of the international monetary system. I also call you doctor because you have your doctorate in law. Not bad, sir. Not bad. Thank you. It, it, it's funny. That's not um, typically in the United States. You do have a doctor's degree. They don't call you a doctor, but they do when you go to Europe. Uh, Europe has a different legal tradition, and when you're a lawyer in Europe, you're, you're typically called Doctor Rickards. So I love registering hotels in Europe because I can be Doctor Rickards. So they, <laughs> all the porters and the bellboys call me that. So it's a it's a nice treat. I love it. I call you Doctor because it gives my it gives us the, the, the podcast more of more gravitas. Exactly, <laughs> it just sounds exactly. like I'm talking. It's just way more intellectual. It's just so more intimidating. I think I like that. So we're all for that. <clears throat> there it is. Uh, the death of money, uh, the coming collapse of the international monetary system. That's it. Those are some just the title itself. Some strong words. How did you choose the title? Well, the, uh, the title's a little bit provocative on the face of it, but you go back over the last hundred years, the international monetary system actually has collapsed three times in the past hundred years: uh, 1914, 1939 and again in 1971. So these things do happen every 30 or 40 years. I mean, that's not every day or every month, but three times in 100 years, that's a pretty good tempo. And oh, by the way, it's been over 40 years since the last one. So that doesn't mean that it's going to happen tomorrow morning like clockwork, but it does mean that if it happened, nobody, be sh- nobody should be surprised because these things do happen from time to time. But I say, you know, a lot of investors today, <clears throat> suffer from what I call the curse of the two-second attention span. Mm-hmm. You know, everything's a blog or a tweet or a hit or whatever, and uh, people don't think about history. They don't think, you know, hey, if something happens every 30 years, that's going to happen two or three times in your lifetime. Right. So don't be surprised. But, or but they I, but not be- only that, they, if they do think about history, they dismiss it. They were like, oh, that was true in that time, but things are different now. Like the rules of history don't apply in 2014. Yeah, they haven't really changed for 5,000 years. That's, uh, you yeah, know, the, 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 char- the characters change. The, you know, we go from togas to, uh, you know, tuxedos or whatever, but uh, the human nature hasn't changed in 100,000 years. But there's also the idea that, you know, you didn't mention 2007. Nobody saw that coming either. I, I, that's almost like the collapse of the money system, but it's certainly the collapse of banks. Um, well, it, it was very close. I mean, we were, uh, you know, I mean, Bear Stearns, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, uh, and Lehman and AIG did, in fact, collapse. Uh, they were all went into bankruptcy or uh, taken over by the government. Morgan Stanley was days away. If, if the government hadn't intervened, a couple days later, Morgan Stanley would have failed. It was on the way. Goldman would have been behind that. Citibank would have been behind that. All the dominoes would have fallen. Now, why didn't they? Well, if you have if you have a bunch of dominoes lined up and they're all you push the first one and they all start falling, you know they're all going to fall. But you can drop a steel curtain between any two dominoes, and that domino will hit the steel, and the next one won't fall. And that's what happened. The government truncated the process, dropped a steel curtain. Now the problem is, you go back to 1998 when the hedge fund long term capital failed, and I was uh, part of that. I was involved with that, and I did that bailout. Wall Street bailed out the hedge fund. Come forward 2008, 10 years later, it was Wall Street that was failing, and the government bailed out Wall Street. My point is the next time, the next collapse is going to be bigger than the government's, and who's going to bail out the central banks? I mean, that, that's the problem. Each time it gets bigger, so you need a bigger brother to come along and like, chase the bully off the schoolyard, mm-hmm. but the next time it's going to be bigger than the central banks themselves. You're saying that the actual the government won't be able to bail out the banks? Correct, because it'll be the government that's in trouble. See, the le- so in 98, just look at the 10-year tempo. In 98, it was a hedge fund that was in trouble, and the banks bailed it out. In 2008, the banks were in trouble, and the government bailed it out. Next time, maybe 2017, 2018, it's the central banks and the sovereigns who are going to be in trouble, and who's going to bail them out? Well, there's only one big brother left, which is the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. But when you, when you get into that, if the IMF is doing the bailout, they're not going to do it in dollars. They're going to do it in world money. They, they have this world money. It has a, a geeky name. It's called Special Drawing Rights, SDRs, which is the name they came up with, so nobody would understand what they're doing. <laughs> but it's just called world money, and people get that. They're like, oh, yeah, world money. Well, they have a world printing press. I mean, this is, this is all on their website. I mean, I've been involved with this for 
on and off for 40 years, going back to my, when I was in graduate school in the 70s. I understand it very well, and some experts do, but not very many people do. But uh, so, so when the central banks themselves are in trouble, such as the Fed and the European Central Bank, who bails them out? And the answer is the IMF can do it, but that's going to be the end of the dollar. It's going to be these SDRs or world money coming in. So that's why I call the book The Death of Money. So again, on the face of it, kind of a provocative title, but it's all just, you know, you can see it happening. But can you explain a little bit about when you say the government is not going to be able to bail out the banks, the government itself will be in trouble. Are you saying that the dollar will be worthless? Is that what you're saying? Well, look, every uh, every currency has become worthless sooner or later. Uh, so uh, th- that's what you're heading towards. Now, it, this would be a kind of hyperinflation. So it would be in multiple steps. So the first step would be there's some kind of financial panic. You know, and the easiest way to describe a financial panic, everybody wants their money back. So all the banks, all the hedge funds, all the mutual funds, they have to start selling stuff to get money to pay back all the people who want their money back. Well, that drives prices down. That puts more people in distress, et cetera. Now, what happened in 2008, that process started. The Fed came along. What did they do? The Fed and, and the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, together, they guaranteed every bank deposit in America. They guaranteed the money market funds. They printed $4 trillion of paper money, which is what they've done since 2008. They did tens of trillions of dollars of swap lines with, with Europe, with the European Central Bank, because, you know, the European banks needed dollars also, but their central bank can't print dollars. It prints euros. So where were they going to get the dollars? Well, they did a swap deal with the Fed. The Fed gave them dollars, and they gave the Fed euros. So the Fed has all these euros. Uh, good luck with that. But the point, the point being, they did this massive multi-trillion dollar money printing swap lending guarantee operation. Now, a lot of that is still in place. So what happens if there's a financial panic next week or next year? What are they, they can't do it again. They already did it. What are they, you know, they went to $4 trillion. What are they going to do, go to $8 trillion? Well, they would create, create massive inflation, right? Well, it will either create massive inflation or a massive loss of confidence, and that those kind of amount to the same thing. If I don't have confidence in the dollar, what do I do? Yeah. By the way, it doesn't mean the end of the world. It just means I want to spend my dollars. I want to get land, gold, art. Uh, you know, I want to be like Warren Buffett. I want to buy a railroad uh, or oil and natural gas. I want to buy stuff. That's yeah, you gonna... talk about you talk about buying raw land and gold and art and things. I mean, in, in, it, it is, is, you, you have a point of view on the kind of investments one should be making right now. Well, well that's right. And again, uh, my, my two best examples are Warren Buffett and China, right? So China's second largest economy in the world. Warren Buffett is the most famous investor in the world. So these guys are not exactly dopes. So when it comes to billionaires, don't listen to what they say. Watch what they do. What has Warren Buffett been doing lately? Well, a couple years ago, he went out and bought a railroad. Well, what is a railroad? It's all hard assets. It's land right away, uh, rail, yards, switches, signals, cars, you know, et cetera. The next deal he did, he went out and bought oil and natural gas. What's well, real stuff? Well, by the way, you got to move the oil. Well, he doesn't care about the Keystone Pipeline because he owns a railroad. You line up 100 tanker cars in a row, that's a pipeline on wheels. So Warren Buffett can now move his own oil on his own railroad. So the dollar could go away. The dollar could go to zero, but a railroad is still a railroad and oil is still oil. He owns hard assets. Whatever currency regime we come up with, he's always going to be wealthy because he owns the hard assets. Now, over to China. What's China doing? Well, they're buying natural resources around the world, but the main thing they're doing is buying gold hand over fist by the thousands of tons. There are only about 35,000 tons of official gold in the world. When I say official gold, that's the gold controlled by governments. 35,000 35, tons. 35,000 tons, but that's it. Wow. That's okay. all the gold in the world controlled by all the central banks and all the sovereign wealth funds, 35,000 tons. China has bought... And I'll, pro- I'll put that into context for you. There's a book called Enumeracy, and I believe he said if you, if you were to take all the gold that's ever been mined throughout history, it would fit under the first tier of the Eiffel, Eiffel Tower. I yes, it, it's, it's, a cube, uh, it's a cube about, um, about 60 feet on each side. So like a small suburban six-story office building or right under the Eiffel Tower or a couple Olympic-sized swimming pools. Pick your metaphor. They're all good, it's by not the way. A lot of, it's not a lot of gold. That, by the way, that's all the gold, what you're just referring to, Brian, that's all the gold in the world. Mm. That's not the official gold. The official gold is a lot smaller than what we just talked about. That cube under the Eiffel Tower, that, that includes the private gold, you know, our wedding rings. So, and, so, so, then, so then let me ask you this. How in the world would we anchor 
the, I know you talk about this, how in the world would we anchor our monetary system to so such a small amount of gold? Well, that's a very good question, and it's usually the first thing that you know uh, opponents say, well, you can't have a gold standard because there's not enough gold. The answer is that's nonsense. There's always enough gold. The question is, what's the price? And that's where it gets interesting, because at the current price, uh, which is about $1,300 an ounce, you know, it bounces around. At $1,300 an ounce, the critics are right. There's not enough gold to support the banking system, world trade, and world finance. <laughs> but at $10,000 an ounce, there is. And so what's the problem here? Is the problem that there's not enough gold, or is the problem is that the dollar's worth a lot less than we think it is, and this is all coming to our head? And then let me, let me just stop you there, w- meaning there are probably too many dollars out there, and that's why it's, it's worth less? Correct. The dollar was delinked from gold in 1971, as we know. Our friend, President Nixon, you know, took us off, closed the gold window right on our fingers so we can't get the gold anymore. Uh, and since then, they've just been printing money. They they haven't been printing gold. You can't. They, they've been mining it. But mining uh, output adds to the supply about 1.5% a year, which is kind of interesting because that's about what world population goes up. It's just, I don't think there's any necessary connection, but one of the reasons gold is a good monetary standard is because it increases at about the rate of productivity of world growth. So it prevents governments from stealing from you through inflation. But since then, we've just been printing money. So if you wanted to go back to a gold standard today and you said, all right, I don't want deflation, I don't want to repeat the Great Depression, what should the price be so that the amount of gold I have can support the amount of money I printed? Well, it's actually an eighth-grade math problem. It's not hard. We know how much gold there is. We know how much money there is. You just divide one by the other. Well, the answer is about $10,000 an ounce. So I say, well, wait a second, it's only $1,300 an ounce today if I want to go buy some. Well, that's true. That's a good reason to buy it, by the way, because it's probably heading to $10,000 an ounce when this, when this crisis comes. But it sort of shows you how much you know, smoke and mirrors there is in the monetary system. Now, if you think gold doesn't... And, and, and I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt. But that's okay. If, 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 so, so say we anchored, let's put the, all the gold, let's, for argument's sake, we put it in one big safe. It's there. Uh, I don't think you'd move it back and forth. Let's just say it's there. And it is, it is, it is, so the, you, the number of dollars or the number of, the, the amount of money, let's say the dollar is tied to the gold standard, the number of dollars that you would allow into the monetary system would be in direct proportion to the n- amount of gold you could actually mine every year. So 1.1, 1. 1, 1.5%. Well, that's one way to do it. Uh, you could add that amount of money. Now, there's another aspect to this, which is, you know, you go back to the 1920s. The U.S. was on a gold standard at the time, but we did have discretionary monetary policy. The Fed was created in 1913, and we, in the 1920s, we were on a gold standard. The Fed could increase or decrease the money supply, but people could vote with their feet. They were free to take that money and go down to the bank and get some gold at a fixed price, not at the market price, but at a fixed price. And so the way it works, the two things can work together, which is, you know, you could have a gold standard where the Fed would be allowed to increase the money supply. And if people thought that was smart policy, they would not run down and cash in their dollars because they would say, you know, you're doing the right thing. But if they thought it was bad policy, if they thought it was going to lead to inflation, then they would run down and cash in their dollars. So in a way, the market tells you, the Fed, if you're doing a good job or not, because if you are doing a good job, people will be confident with the money. If you're not doing a good job, they'll be lined up at your door to get the gold. So this is a way to use market forces and and people's individual decision-making ability combined with discretionary monetary policy to run a sound money system. And people are like, you know what, I have confidence in you because I know that if you start to steal from me through inflation, I can run down and get the gold at a fixed price. And so you can still have discretionary monetary policy. You can still increase the money supply if you think that's what you need to do to get out of a recession. But if you go too far, then people are going to, as they say, lose confidence. And, and that's a good system because there's a rule. You know, it's not just how much money do I feel like printing. What side of the bed does Janet Yellen get out of this morning? Uh, there's a thought. But it's more, it's more like, you know, let the market tell you if you're doing a good job or not. Why, why is there, and I'm sure that you, when you talk to bankers and you talk to financial professionals, a lot of them, when you, when you even start mentioning the gold standard, and you've done a great job of arguing for it in this book, but most people kind of shake their heads and they go, not practical, or yeah, but, and you get a lot of that, don't you? 
you hear it all you hear it all the time and you hear it from you know phd economists like uh, you know the great uh, the great rubini uh, Honorio rubini <laughs> but hey, uh... <laughs> hunter hunter please please sir some respect on the brian callen show well, we're I... talking to a doctor here a doctor we're talking to dr james g rickards the great the great dr rubini well the thing is they always say the same things and they don't think it through they, the first thing they say is the thing we just talked about they say well there's not enough gold well of course there is it's just a question of price they get the price right guys Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing they say is, well, don't you know that gold caused the Great Depression? Well, what caused the Great Depression, what contributed to it? It wasn't exactly a gold standard. It was a funky hybrid called the gold exchange standard. But the problem was when they went to it, this was after World War I. You know, we've been on a gold standard before. After World War I, we wanted to get back to a gold standard. And they came up with this hybrid, but, but they got the price wrong. They set the price too low. So, again, when the price is too low, yes... The money supply is not big enough, and that did contribute to the Great Depression. But the problem wasn't the gold. It was the price. And that's why I've been explaining that, you know, if you want to go back to a gold standard, you better get the price right. And that price is $10,000 an ounce or even higher under some methods. And so at 1300 you ought to be buying some because that's where it's going to end up. And so, but, but, but let me stop you for a second because a lot of our financial and I don't. I'm not an expert by any means, but I, I I I keep going back to the idea of leverage. And a lot of our financial system is based on the idea that I think this money is worth more than 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 you think it is. I mean, isn't that what we? Isn't that what a lot of we? You know, if you have a company and I say I think your company's worth. Fifty million dollars, and you think it's worth a hundred million dollars? Well, we're going to have a disagreement based on that. But you're saying that the money that they're talking about should be anchored to something. So it, that never changes, is what you're right. saying. But, but right. I feel, I feel like money itself, the dollar is traded uh, uh, based on what we think the value of that dollar is going to be in the future. Is, is, am I wrong? No, Brian. What, what are you referring <laughs> to? And there's a there's a one word name for it, which are markets. And you're right. You and I can disagree on the value of you know Tesla or Apple. You know, maybe I think Tesla's a government subsidy, and somebody else thinks it's the greatest thing since uh, electricity. Well, that's fine. Uh, that's what makes markets. So, company stocks uh, fluctuate, commodities fluctuate, um, and that's that's good. That's a good thing because the disagreement of all the people involved is giving us signals that tell us smart ways to allocate capital. So that's what markets do. But the problem is we don't have markets anymore. We have kabuki theater because everything's orchestrated by the Fed. Once the Fed sets the interest rates at zero and starts printing money but keeps the interest rates at zero by buying the bonds through quantitative easing, now money's, money's at the heart of everything. Everything we talk about is denominated in some amount of money. So if you're rigging the money, you're rigging everything by extension. Housing, stocks, uh, you know, every, everything we can think of. So we rely on markets and the legitimate disagreements you talked about to tell us what things are worth so we can make smart decisions. But all the markets are rigged by the Fed, and so guess what? We're making a lot of dumb decisions. I mean, mm. people, people don't know. You know, I, I talk to stock market investors every day. I mean, I manage a mutual fund. We've got to wake up in the morning and figure out things to do. And everybody I talk to, people have been in the business 30, 40 years. They say, <clears throat> this makes no sense. This is a bubble. We don't get it, but we have to buy them because there's nothing else to buy. You know, the bank pays you nothing. Treasury notes pay you nothing. You know, gold has been volatile. That's a whole separate story involving manipulation. You know, Europe is slowing down. China's imploding. The Japanese GDP just fell off a cliff. You look around the world, and all you can buy is stocks. Well, yeah, that's fine until the stock market drops 30%. You've lost 30% of your money, and you're, you wake up and say, what happened? Mm. This, this is the kind of... This is, these are the distortions and the consequences you get from the Fed having complete discretion to do what they want. So when I talk about a gold standard, I'm not saying get rid of the Fed, although there's a case for that. <laughs> I'm not saying get rid of the Fed. I'm not saying get rid of discretionary monetary policy. I'm just saying have a rule, have a guide, have some kind of anchor. If you're in a boat and you don't have an anchor, you're going to drift all over the ocean, hit a rock, and sink. Uh, but if you have an anchor, you can, you know, you're in a stable place. And so this is just an anchor to take away some of the discretion. If you think that Janet Yellen, I mean, Janet Yellen, I don't think she's had a private sector job. In a way. She's brilliant, tell, by tell, the way. Us, tell us who she is, by the way. Uh, Janet Yellen is the chairwoman of the Federal Reserve, so she's the most powerful central banker in the world. 
She controls the dollar. By the way, she is at least three times smarter than I am. I, I guarantee you. I've met a lot of these PhDs and Nobel Prize. But Prize there's centers. a difference. There's a difference, and I and I wanted to say this, and I, which I really appreciate. You are currently in the marketplace. You are. A, you're not an academic. You are a guy who's actually in there, getting your hands dirty and working within the marketplace. You're, I'm a poor, I'm a portfolio manager of a mutual fund, and yeah. uh, I have partners, and we have investors, and yeah. we care deeply about how those investors do, and we got to get this stuff right. So yeah, yeah. I'm actually. A there is a big difference between a, it's kind of like somebody who's a boxer in a ring and somebody who's a, who's who knows a lot about boxing from watching it. Well, we're in the ring occasionally we get our nose bloody and we learn fast how to look out for a left hook. I mean, this is what, you know, Teddy Roosevelt said about the the person in the ring as opposed to the spectator. So <laughs> Well, uh, no, I, so they call me the Teddy Roosevelt of podcasting. Well, there you go. <laughs> we're, we're, on the, we're on the same page there. Exactly, you, exactly. You, you and Hunter are the Rough Riders. So. <laughs> that's, that's right. Uh, that yeah, sounds but, but no, that's exactly right. And by the way, it's a great teacher because you don't, you don't always get it right. You never, no one always gets it right. The idea is to be right more than you're wrong. Right. And when you're right, try to make more money than you lose on the times you're wrong. But the times you're wrong are instructive. I call it paying tuition. You learn from that. And, and you, but, the, but the problem is you rely on the market to be a good teacher, but if the Fed's distorting the market, it's like the teacher's on drugs. You know, you're not, you're not learning anything. And, so, and you were saying Janet Yellen, who's three times smarter than you with her Ph.D. At least three times smarter. She's got a Ph.D., <laughs> but she spent her whole career in either academia or government. Mm-hmm. So she was a professor at uh, University of California, Berkeley, uh, she was president of the San Francisco Fed. She's now chairwoman of the Federal Reserve. She's married to a Nobel Prize winner. I mean, she hangs out communist, with a smart communist, crowd. Communist, communist, left wing communist. <laughs> <laughs> I can just Look, hear it. Here's the thing. She's probably I don't know. She's probably I don't know her personally. I, she's probably a very nice person, but uh, she has no practical experience. She relies on models. The models are flawed. They don't sync up with reality. It's like it's like I have a model that says the sun revolves around the Earth. Uh, and I want to send a man to the moon. I got the wrong model. The guy's going to end up, he's going to be like, you know, he's going to end up in space. He's going to miss the moon. Right. You, you got to get the right model. The right model is complexity theory, you know, all these things, the black swan, the Minsky moment, these uh, tipping points, these things that people talk about. There's actually science behind that. None of it should come as a surprise if you understand how, ca- how complex things are. But they've reduced it to these models that don't work. They get it wrong every time. I mean, you go back and look at the summer of 07. Bernanke was quoted as saying, this will blow over. I mean, those are his exact words. This will blow over. Yep, yep. Look at I was going to say that but when, when people like you, yourself historically have never been listened to until after the, after the fact. Well, it's good to have an audience, and I'm very appreciative of you know, people buy my books, and I'm appreciative of the opportunity to you know, be on the air and, and do interviews and so forth. But, uh, but I look at the central banks, and I look at the Treasury, and I look at the people actually running the system. By the way, I talk to these people. I am I'm fortunate to, uh, I am fortunate to be you know, invited down. I've briefed the Treasury behind closed doors on risk management. I've you know, been at the Fed. I talked to some of these top Fed officials or personal friends of mine. So, uh, you know, same thing with the IMS. So I do have a lot of points of contact, and invariably they're nice people. They're not, it's not like some, you know, black hat conspiracy. But as I said, it doesn't matter how smart you are. If you have the wrong model, you're going to get the wrong result every single time, and that's what we're seeing. Well, and I think also the other thing that's important to remember is that people like Janet Yellen have a conflict of interest. Like if Janet Yellen comes in and is like, guess what, Obama, we can't just keep pr- printing money limitlessly. Well, he's going to find someone who's going to want to do that for him. Well, that's a very powerful uh, point, Hunter. And there's uh, actually someone has come out with a paper on that recently. Uh, the guy's name is Rick Mishkin. Now, Mishkin is the ultimate insider. He's a Ph.D. professor at Columbia University. He was on the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve, so he was in the room. He was a mentor of Ben Bernanke. So this guy is as much of an insider as you're ever going to find. And he wrote a paper recently, and he said exactly what you refer to. He, he actually had a name for it. He called it fiscal dominance. And fiscal dominance means, look, it doesn't matter what you think. At the end of the day, if the government wants the money and you're the central bank, you've got to print the money. So if we can't get these deficits under control, if we can't get spending under control, if the White House and Congress can't work together, if none of this stuff is working, then your theory doesn't matter. You're just going to have to print the money and let the inflation roll and inflation is theft from savers. People ask me, you know, why do you write these books? Why do you, you know, go on lecture tours and so forth? And I always say, I'm thinking of my 83-year-old mother. My mother's, you know, she's fine, but she's living on a pension and a fixed income, and she's got a certain amount of savings. 
and she's the first victim of inflation. When you cheapen the value of the dollar, her pension doesn't go up and her savings don't go up. They get worth less and less and less. So I think of my mom, but also tens of millions of, Mar- of Americans relying on insurance, annuities, retirement income, savings, any kind of fixed income. They're the victims when this inflation gets out of control. And if you print enough money, that's what's going to happen. Well, and as, as Milton Friedman said, right, inflation is taxation without legislation. Correct. And uh, the other two, and Friedman was right about that. And the other two people who made the same point were, believe it or not, John Maynard Keynes and uh, Vladimir Lenin. Wow. Uh, they said the uh, opposite you know, side of the spectrum there. Yeah. yeah. Lenin said inflation is the surest way to destroy a government. He was all in favor of it because he wanted to destroy Western <laughs> governments. And Keynes said that. Uh, that not one man in a million understands inflation, so it's a very effective way to tax people and steal their money because nobody gets it. Uh, and I make the same point about these, you know, these SDRs, special drawing rights, uh, you know, we talked about earlier, which is world money. I should call it world money because I think people understand that. That's just a different printing press. And when, when the Fed runs out of ink and paper, by the way, you go back to 1922 in Germany, a lot of people remember, heard about the Weimar hyperinflation, the hyperinflation of the Weimar Republic. That was so bad. Back then, they didn't have digital money the way we do today. They actually had to print it. They ran out of paper and ink. They started printing their bills on one side, not the other, so they could save ink. That's how bad it was. They were having to kind of put in special orders for paper. Well, come forward to today, I mean, when the U.S., when the Fed runs out of ink and paper, so to speak, they're just going to hand it over to the IMF. Well, and, and I think that was one of the great points that you made in the book about SDRs, right? You know, there, uh, uh, John Oliver, who has that show last week tonight, he was talking about net neutrality, and he was saying that what the government has figured out is, is that if you want people to go along with something stupid or evil, you just make it really boring. And that's <laughs> the give point. It a, give it a boring name. People hear it, their eyes glaze over, and they move on. Meanwhile, you're running, running the show. By the way, that's true of... Uh, well, that's true of a lot of things. First of all, the SDRs, you know, special drawing rights, I call it world money, are printed by the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. Well, that's really the central bank of the world, right? And I, I have a chapter on that in my book, Chapter 8. I call it Central Bank of the World. So the IMF is a phony baloney name for the central bank of the world. But go all the way back to 1913, when the Federal Reserve was created. The Federal Reserve is the central bank of the United States. So why didn't they call it? the central bank of the United States. I mean, you have the Bank of England, the Bank of Japan, the Swiss National Bank. They all have names that people understand. Well, the reason was the United States had central banks twice before, uh, in the early 19th century and in the mid-19th century. And both times, the American people got rid of them. The American people hate central banks. So in 1913, 1912, 1913, when it was being formed, and it was, you know, the Rockefellers and the Morgans and, uh, um, you know, Senator Aldridge from Rhode Island. There was a little cabal. You know, this is the famous Jekyll Island story, which is not invented, by the way. It's real. There's a real place called Jekyll Island. They really did go there under assumed names. They really did haul off for a week and cook this stuff up. It's all true. But the point is, they say, well, we can't call it the central bank because Americans hate central banks. So let's call it the Federal Reserve. And nobody will understand what that is, and most people don't. So it actually works. You know, Hunter and I talk about this all the time. We, we, we had a conversation before we had you on, and I said, no, I, these are very important issues, and it's important, and, they're, and, and you're asking very important questions <clears throat> and providing important solutions. Uh, whether or not those can be debated or not is, is, is not the point. I said we have to be very careful sometimes when you use certain language. <clears throat> International Monetary Fund, um, uh, finance, uh, capital markets. Most people I know, and it's not their fault, they glaze over. Right. Uh, it just sounds too heavy and boring and drab. You know, this is what happens. And <clears throat> and I, I and, th- th- and so Hunter's point about using boring language, uh, boring, using confusing language, uh, lang- uh, words you don't usually hear, is a very good way to get people to tune out. Ab- so- absolutely. So so just imagine. <clears throat> Imagine if the Federal Reserve was called the Central Bank of the United States. Hmm. Imagine if the IMF was called the Central Bank of the World. And imagine if the SDR was called World Money. Okay, mm-hmm. so we, we were talking about the Central Bank of the United States, the Central Bank of the World, and World Money. Most people would have an intuitive understanding of that. They're like, they don't have to be PhDs. They're like, oh, I kind of get that. Sure. But when you say Federal Reserve, IMF, and SDR, it's like, well, what, what the heck? It sounds like a prescription drug. I, 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 yeah. I literally think of gray cloth and ties. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, and by the way, this, this, is still, this is still going on. Now, here's, here's one that will hurt your head. 
macroprudential regulation. Oh, there's one. That'll put you to sleep, Jeez, right? Macroprudential, yes. Ma- well, you, can, you, well, here's, quit talking here's, dirty, Jim Murphy. Go on code, right? But here's a tip for the listeners. Whenever they hear the word macroprudential, think of you can't get your money back. Mm-hmm. Yes, the SEC just pushed through a rule. This is a brand new rule. It's about a couple of weeks old. Now, what's a money market fund? Right? Pe- most people think of money market funds the same as they think of the bank account. They're like, hey, if I want my money, I can get it. If you have a money market fund right now, you think that if you call them up today, you can get your money tomorrow. That's what most people think. Right. This new rule says, uh-uh, they can suspend redemptions. That is, under certain circumstances, they can decide not to give you your money back. Suddenly, your your next day liquid money market fund is locked in. It's this, frozen. Is, this is a way. This is this is basically their way of stopping a run on the banks. Correct. So th- so that's the actually the interesting thing about the next time we've been talking about the next panic. The last time they printed up a lot of money and said, "Well, here's your money. We'll, we just print it." The next time they know that they can't run that playbook twice, right? Yeah. So they're just going to say, "Well, we got a better idea. You can't get your money back." You know wow. how, how does that feel? And by the way, you think that can't happen? Look at Cyprus. A couple of years ago, it's a small country, but that's exactly what happened. And now it's coming to this country one step at a time. And it goes under this banner of macroprudential regulation. But think of it as, hey, I can't get my money back. So all the more reason to have some physical gold. Not a lot, by the way. I recommend 10%. Uh, but I'm not a gold salesman. I, I'm not a coin dealer. I don't get commissions if people buy gold. I, I I recommend that they do. But, you know, I don't make money on that. But But I do think it's good advice. Not 50%, by no means 100%, just 10%. Think 10%, of it, you're saying 10% of the money supply should be anchored? No, 10% no, 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 of your 10% net worth. 10% of your personal liquid oh, net worth. So I tell people, don't, don't count. If you have a small business or home equity, don't count that. Put that to one side. Take what's left. Those are your liquid assets that you can buy stocks and bonds. Put 10% of that in physical gold. Wow. Um, keep it in a safe place. And then that is your insurance policy. So if, if I'm way wrong and you know nothing horrible happens... You know, that'll probably just maintain its value and you won't get hurt. But if I'm right and all these other things get wiped out, then that's going to go up, you know, two, three, four, five times. That's your insurance policy. So it's like having fire insurance on your house. You don't want your house to burn down. But but let me play devil's advocate for a yeah. second because I'm looking at let's just take e-commerce. I'm looking at the America that works uh, to quote the Economist. I mean uh, the 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 network. I mean the internet and commerce on the internet and the economy as I see it out there. And I do a lot of traveling. I, I I'm not seeing Armageddon. I, I'm seeing a lot of innovation coming out of the United States. I'm seeing a fairly robust economy. China has got some problems, but for the most part, I don't see. Um, People are economic animals. The economy is moving. Cars are running. So, you know, a lot of people would be uh, uh, forgiven for looking at the world, the tangible world outside them and reading the newspaper and saying, you know what? We all have to stay in business. We're all selling coffee and food and cars and we all we got to we got to keep moving. So maybe it's fine. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, that is what you're dealing with, isn't it? Most yeah, people are going, is... well, you know, that's somebody else's problem, and ultimately it's going to be fine. You can understand why they feel that way, because when you talk about the collapse of everything, you're almost talking about, you know, a world war or something. Well, uh, for, well first of all, we have, there's, a, there's a history of world wars, you know, going back to you know, Napoleonic Wars, the wars of Louis XIV, uh, you know, World War One, World War Two. Uh, you know, et cetera. So that, that's, don't think that history is over, and I know you don't, but, right. but let's not rule that out. But let's talk about the economy and exactly the terms you described, Brian, and you're right. Uh, look, uh, I have uh, three adult children in their uh, you know, 20s and early 30s, and uh, they're friends their age, and I mentor them. And I, I, couldn't, I agree with you. I couldn't be more impressed with uh, the innovation and the spunk. And I, I tell people in their 20s and you know, late 20s that you can't get a job. Forget it. Start your own job. Start your own company. And, and, and they are. So there is a lot of innovation, uh, and, it's, and it's great to see. And we're, we're, the technology is doing great things in oil and energy and natural gas and fracking. And stuff. But just put all that together. Okay, think for a second. Is that, is that inflationary or deflationary? Well, that's highly deflationary because it's more efficient. It's the good kind of deflation. You know, what's wrong with prices going down? So we, we welcome the innovation, but it's very recognized it's very deflationary. Well, what happens to the real value of debt when you have deflation? The debt goes up. 
So we still, so yes, while the economy is moving along, we got all this innovation. Meanwhile, the government, the debt to GDP ratio is still going up. The printing presses are still humming. We're still borrowing money we can't repay. Most and if people, you, and most if you people have, are in crippling debt. Look at how many student loans. Look at, look at, look at, like how many kids are never getting out of their debt. Well, and Jim, you talk about that—the fact that you know student loans are the next Ponzi scheme. Well, well, that's right, because think, think about how that works. Okay, so uh, I get out of Brown University, let's say. I've got $150,000 in debt. I got no job. I'm living in my parents' basement, and I can't pay the debt. Now, a lot of people don't know that. Um, you say, well, the American way, actually, is to file for bankruptcy. Clear the slate, start over. That, that is the American way. You know, in Europe, they used to put you in debtor's prison. In America, they give you a clean break. But there are two things you cannot get rid of in bankruptcy. One of them is taxes. Well, that makes sense, right? Where the government let you off the hook there? Yeah. But the other one is student loans. You cannot get rid of student loans. So you're not getting rid of that debt. So now you, you can't get a job. You can't pay it. What happens? Your credit rating deteriorates. So what happens then? Well, you go to get a job. Well, employers are using credit scores as a screening mechanism because they say, well, if you're a deadbeat, you'll probably steal from me, so I'm not going to hire you. So now you can't get a job. You can't get an apartment. You can't get a mortgage. So we're, ta- we're taking our best and brightest, and we're turning them into lifetime debt slaves because they can't get their first home, their first apartment, or their first job. Now, there is a program that says, oh, we'll cap your student loan payments. We'll let you off the hook a little bit if you take a government-approved job. And then there's a list of those you know, put out by the White House. So the point being, Amazing. It's we're an- taking our best and brightest, we're turning them into debt slaves, and we're saying, oh, we'll let you off the hook a little bit if you do what we tell you. Yeah, if you become a bureaucrat for the government. And Correct. The government, and the government gets bigger and more Right. So, that, so, there, so that's wasted talent. We talked earlier about the entrepreneurial talent. I do see it out there, and you're right about that, Brian, but we've got a lot of wasted talent because of this student yep. loan debacle. By the way, where's that money going? Where's that student loan money going? It's going to unions. It's going to, you know, a lot of it actually doesn't even go to the professors. It goes to administrators. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're all those university employees, which are highly bloated, uh, are all union jobs. So it's a conduit from the Treasury to the unions. The students are just a- human ATMs, but they end up as the debt slaves. So that's another the, debacle. The, 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 good another. News, the good news is that I think <clears throat> education is becoming cheaper and cheaper, and you're going to be able to get a first-class education with your computer yeah, but, at your home. Thing, yeah, hopefully. of course, but you've always been able to do that. You've been able to get a first-class education by it's going becoming, to your library. It's becoming easier. No, but it's not a question of becoming easier because the point of what universities do, universities are not in the business of education. They're in the business of accreditation. Mm. They give you a stamp that says you're a legitimate person and that you have the right to have You'll ideas to, about certain aren't topics. Aren't you able to do that more and more online, though? No, be- but that's the point is, is that, you know, Harvard, Harvard has a monopoly on yeah. granting Harvard degrees. Right. So does Stanford and so does Brown and so do all of these things. It's about prestige, yeah. right? It's it's a psychological thing. It's not about actual learning I of think, ideas. I think that prestige will erode as 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 people get, you know, realize that like you were saying, um, Jim, that the, you know, it's going to put you in debt to a, to the tune of $150,000 and in your parents' basement for the next 10 years. Right. And all by the way, sudden, one of, one of the uh, gems there is there is a midway point. Hunter's exactly right about the ability to, to be self-educated. I'm, I'm a great autodidact. I teach myself a lot of stuff. But, but there's, a pl- there's a place between that and Harvard, which is some of our state universities are fabulous research institutions. You know, uh, University of Colorado, uh, University of uh, uh, Nebraska. These are, you know, okay, maybe they've got good football teams and the good party schools, but they're also, they get a lot of research grants. They've got a lot of uh, top-tier scientists. And of course, if you're in state, that tuition is a little bit less. So there's a bargain there. So I think I think kind of right. Market forces they may, they may be slow, but they're they're working. And by the way, going back to the earlier in the interview, when you say why don't people understand gold or why don't people see the benefit of it? Well, it hasn't been taught for 40 years. If you if you're if you're younger than I am, if you if you were born after the mid 1950s, let's say, if you know anything about gold, you are self-taught. Or else you went to mining college because they stopped teaching in the economics departments forty over forty years ago. Right. But however, fortunately, and I think Hunter's kind of right, there are a lot of resources online, um, you know, institutes, uh, the tutorials, interviews, you name it. Just go find them where people are learning. So that's a very encouraging thing as well. How do we, Jim? How do we talk to people about this? I mean, uh, this is an important book. And so maybe the first thing to say is, hey, you got to read books like The Death of Money, The Come and Collapse of the International Monetary System by, by Dr. James G. Rickards. Fine. Most people could look at you and go, yeah, yeah, right. And, and we'll put it on our website and we'll push the book, of course. But talk to me about how we get these ideas out there 
and and how do you talk to people when you're at a cocktail party or you're giving a speech? What what is in a nutshell the best way to convey these very important ideas? Well, one of the best ways is just to use the the, the concept of insurance. You know, and again, I, I come back to gold, and I say, you know, the reason you have ten percent gold is like. Uh, it's your protection. It, it, it will it will preserve your wealth if everything else falls apart. One of the things you can do, and I try hard to do, is just speak in plain English. You know, avoid the kinds of jargons we were jargon we were talking about earlier. You know, an economist will say, you know, they'll talk about downward nominal wage rigidity. What's that? Well, it means that people don't like to take a pay cut, right? <laughs> Nobody likes to take a pay cut. So why why would I say downward nominal wage rigidity when I can just say people don't like to take a pay cut? So a little little uh, bit of a little bit of plain English. I'm not, unless there's way. a brainy, there's a really brainy hot economist gal in front of you. <laughs> if you want to impress her, that's about the only way you'd use that ridiculous. I'll punch somebody in the face if they use that word. I, I know. So so just plain English, a little bit of metaphor. Yeah. You know, when I when I talked to my publisher about writing my books, I was very clear. I said, I do not want to write for an academic audience. I don't want to write for 20 PhDs. I want to write for everyone who cares enough to pick up the book and read it. And by the way, my books are heavily annotated. I've, they've got 300 footnotes, so you don't have to read the footnotes. That can be boring. But if you, if you, if you read something, it kind of piques your interest a little bit. Go to the notes, and there's a primary source, and you can go look at that and learn a little bit more about it. How much time do you spend debating people, the naysayers? Uh... I spend a lot of time, um, you know, whether it's online or, you know, on, on Twitter. I'm very active on Twitter, by the way. My Twitter feed is at James G. Rickards. And, uh, you know, I follow a certain group, and some people follow me, and I'm out there all the time. But, you know, they have what they call some, actually, real debates I, I always welcome. I, I like real debates because, you know, it's like playing tennis with a good opponent. that You bring up your game, and it sharpens you up. But And you got these trolls and naysayers and all that. And you yeah. just kind of have to ignore those. I mean, you know what that's like. Well, I'd love to get Janet Yellen on and, and, and yourself on and just have a conversation. Forget the debate. Let's have a conversation about, let's see what the pro- let, Let's see if we can agree on what the problem is. And if we can't agree on what the problem is, it'd be fun to talk about, you know, why she holds her point of view and why you hold your point of view. I think these are... These are very important, and we can make it fun, but it's just important stuff to get out there. Man. I, I, mm-hmm. have, uh, I am always available for debate. It, it's funny. I, I don't uh, – well, I'll just, I'll just say. I have offered – because you know, I deal with a lot of um, you know, radio and television hosts, fo- folks like yourself, who have said, hey, Jim, if you ever want to debate you know, Rubini or Krugman or Yellen or any of these people, we'll, we'll host you on the show. We would love I'd to have love, that. I would love to see you with Krugman. He annoys me. Right. But the thing is, I make that offer, and I always get that turned down or ignored. You know, those people won't debate me, and I'm I'm like, hey, let's just you know, you say your piece, I'll say mine. Let the viewer decide. The viewer always wins, or the listener always wins. Yep. Wins. There's no question about that. But uh, they will they will not do it. They will turn you down. They don't want that. They don't want to be tested that, that way. might be because they don't live in the real world. No, but I think it's more fundamental than that. I mean, I think that's the point. Is is that we're not being allowed to decide on the merit of people's ideas. Right. Like, you know, uh-huh. it, it's all the great and powerful laws, you know, and nobody, I mean, like, you know, it's easier for these people to hide behind their curtain and hide behind their PhDs and not have to ha- explain their ideas in plain English so that we as the voters can evaluate which system do we want to live in. Do we want to live in a system with quantitative easing, a.k.a. printing money you don't have, or do we want to live in a system where money is a public good that is protected and anchored to gold? I, I agree with that, Hunter. And, but there is there is one kind of a little there's one aspect to that which is uh, maybe a little murkier and a little more dangerous. Which is some of them, not all of them. Some of them actually believe what they're saying, which is scary enough. <laughs> but some of them don't. Some of them understand what we're talking about, but they want to lie to people anyway because they know if they told the truth, there would be a loss of confidence. I mean, you see this mm-hmm. you see this all the time. Sure. These, you know, the stock market keeps getting shut down. Nasdaq keeps getting shut down every every couple of months or half a day. They never tell us why. Well, they discovered recently there was a Russian attack virus put in, not by criminal gangs, but by the Russian government that would attack and destroy the Nasdaq. So you think they want to be honest about that? People would run for the hills. So there's a lot of stuff going on that uh, some of these people are not as, uh, they all have high IQs, but they're not as uh, naive as, as we sometimes think they are. I doubt do they know are. Going yeah. over. They just yeah. can't. They can't be honest about it. But but Krugman has written, you know, end this depression now, the conscience of a liberal, the, the, uh, the return of depression economics, the great unraveling, peddling prosperity. This guy is, I mean, he is out there, uh, and I read his column a lot, and it, it really does sound like he's such a fan of government intervention or just sort of like top-down, centralized sort of 
uh, and and he he almost sounds like he's anathema to your whole your whole philosophy. Well, is that well, true? Is that fair? Yeah. Well, what's, here's the interesting thing about Krugman. Krugman and I are the only two guys using the D word, meaning depression, because right? everyone else is the recession, the Great Recession, the yeah. recovery. Krugman and I both call it a depression. This is a depression, by the way. But that's where so that's as much as we have in common. But where we part ways is the solution. Krugman says it's a depression, so let's print all the money we need. And my answer is, it's a depression, so let's make some structural changes to get the economy back on track. So we completely disagree on the remedy, but we actually agree on the disease, which is this is a depression. Everyone else is sort of you know, using the, the R word, re- recession and recovery. This, what we had was not a recession. It, it wasn't in a technical sense, but dynamically, it's not a recession. This is not a recovery. We're in a depression, the first one since the 1930s, and we're going to stay there indefinitely. And people don't know what a depression is. They think it means continuous declining GDP. That's not the definition. You can have growth in a depression, but it's below trend. In other words, if your trend or your capacity is 3 to 4% and you're actually growing at 1% to 2%, that gap between the the 1% and the 3%, that's depressed growth, and that's lost wealth. And you never make it up. That's what a depression is. That's what we're in. We're chugging along at 1% to 2%. Yeah, we're creating some jobs, and yeah, GDP is going up. But it's not going up anywhere near what this country is capable of, and, and that's just lost wealth, and it'll be permanently lost wealth. So that's what a depression is. Krugman gets it. I get it. But then we just part ways because he wants to print money, and I want to get back to fundamentals. Yeah, totally, to, totally diametrically opposed. It's like this, 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 uh, two very different ideas at war with each other. Hey, so I, I probably have to uh, to jump, but this has just been uh, just been fabulous. I really, really appreciate the opportunity to, to come on and talk to you guys. We love having you on. You are always welcome. We we appreciate all your time. And, uh, and thank you for writing these books. I mean, yeah. I think that's the thing. I think for, you know, the, getting past the terms like SDR and quantitative easing and IMF and just being told this is the common sense way to understand it. I mean, we need people like you, Jim Rickards. Thank you. That's right. Dr. James uh, G. Rickards, the book is The Death of Money, The Coming Collapse of the International Monetary System. Pick it up and read it. It's worth it. And uh, you're welcome back anytime, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. That was awesome. Yeah, man. I think that's the thing. I think when you, you know, Ben Dyson, Detlef Schlichter. Detlef Schlichter? Schlichter. Detlef Schlichter. (laughs) Schlichter. And then, you know, now James G. Records. I think that's the, I think as a voter, what I think has become incredibly clear is answering the question of what is money, who and how should it be created? Yeah, but then you've got a guy like Paul Krugman who's written 20 books and countless articles, and there's a whole different point of view on the other side. I happen to, I happen to, but doesn't, my opinion doesn't actually matter. I'm always lectured on, but but Rickards makes more sense to me personally. I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm more apt to go with the guy who lives in the real world and has to turn a dollar. I think that's important. I think, I think there's a place for academia. No, because I, I but, don't, th- I think that's the point. I don't, I don't buy into that. Mm-hmm. Like in general, the idea that, oh, you're a person in the real world, right. you're not a person in the real world. I don't think that's a basis for making a decision. Right. It should be decided on the idea itself Mm. it should be like you explain why your system makes the most sense you explain why your system makes the most sense and then we sort through let's look at history let's look at the data data, let's look at what actually makes sense and then we make a decision but i think that's the point is is that currently the voters have abdicated that responsibility they're not taking responsibility for deciding how money is being created and they have to take responsibility for that as they did in the past. I and mean, that as requires, he said, but that requires investigation. And, and a lot of people just don't have the time. As no, far as people don't make the time. Yeah. And I think that's the thing is, is that if you are, you know, if you're wondering, you know, why or is your financial situation in a disaster? Well, it's because you haven't made the time to understand the money supply. And, you know, you are being taxed by the government through inflation because that's the whole point is is that when they tax you through inflation, the reason they do that is because they can. Yeah, because you're not paying attention. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, if you want to see me do stand up, go to my website, ryancallen.com, and I'll be at San Antonio in September. I'll be be all over the place. Bye. You've been listening to The Brian Callen Show with Brian Callen. Be sure to like him on Facebook. Just search for Brian Callen Comedy. And follow him on Twitter. Just search for at Brian Callen. You can also find him online by visiting his website. Just go to briancallen.com. Until next time, bye-bye.